so um, let's get started. Let's see, a few more <laughs> folks to admit here. So anyway, uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to the SSP uh, Wednesday uh, seminar. And welcome to all those who have uh, tuned in our, on our live stream on YouTube. I'm really delighted today uh, to welcome uh, to uh, MIT SSP Christian Bros, who is the Chief uh, Strategy Officer at Onderil Industries, a venture-backed defense uh, technology company. He's also a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a member of the Aspen Strategy Group, and especially for our purposes, uh, the author of uh, The Kill Chain, uh, Defending America, in the Future of uh, High-Tech Warfare, which was uh, published in April uh, of this year. Uh, he has an extensive career uh, in uh, thinking about and legislating uh, defense policy. Uh, from 2009 to 2014, he served as a senior policy advisor to Senator John McCain, supporting his work on the Senate Armed Services Committee, as well as many other committees. Uh, from 2014 to 2018, uh, Chris was the staff director of the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, in particular, he managed the production, negotiation, and final passage of four uh, National Defense Authorization Acts, for which there must be some kind of medal if you have to do that work. So um, uh, if anyone knows how, 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 how the, uh, the process uh, unfolds, I think it's Chris. So we're really delighted uh, to have you uh, here today, and uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you, Taylor. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, I think the, the only medal I got for my time moving all of those NDAAs through the process is uh, like political shrapnel that I'm still picking out of my body. Um, it'll be with me, I think, for, uh, for forever. But uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to be with you. I'm honored by the invitation and really eager just to um, you know, share some of my thoughts in terms of uh, the book that I wrote, uh, which was the basis or uh, kind of the result of a lot of the thinking that I had a chance to do while I was in government, you know, really thinking about the question of the challenges we're facing from a national defense standpoint, um, obstacles to change, uh, those types of things. Um, I get bored listening to myself talk, you know, once I go past about 10 minutes, but I, I will try to give you kind of the, the, the high points or sort of the takeaways that, that I sort of hit in the book and then really uh, look forward to having a conversation with all of you and hearing your thoughts, uh, comments, criticisms, um, and having a discussion about them. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start the same way I started the book, um, you know, a, a bit anecdotally. Um, you know, one of the last conversations that I had with Senator McCain um, when he was still in Washington, you know, before he went back to Arizona for you know, what ultimately proved to be, uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, an extended period of time prior to his passing um, was in the aftermath of having set up a briefing for uh, all of the 100 senators um, on a subject that he had asked me to arrange, uh, which was, you know, essentially how the United States military measures up to, uh, to our competitors and primarily uh, to great power competitors, China, Russia, and others. And, uh, he really wanted the briefing to be a wake-up call. Um, he wanted people to get a better understanding of the kinds of problems that, you know, we were living on a day-to-day -day basis through the oversight that we were doing of the Department of Defense and the U.S. military, um, and really to understand the, you know, the really dire circumstances that, you know, our national defense, I think, is increasingly facing. So uh, we, we arranged this briefing, you know, one of the lead briefers was, uh, David Akmanik, who's a, a senior fellow at the RAND Corporation and a uh, long-serving defense official, uh, RAND strategy in the Pentagon under President Obama. And, uh, you know, it was a, uh, an internal briefing that I won't get into the details of, but, you know, I, uh, last year uh, in a public setting, um, you know, David Akmanik, you know, spoke about the very subject that uh, we spent time inside of that uh, Senate briefing room discussing. Um, you know, sort of what is the predicament facing U.S. national defense and how we match up to our competitors. And, you know, he's run dozens of war games for the Department of Defense. And uh, this is what he said, you know, quote unquote, when we fight China or Russia, uh, blue gets its ass handed to it. Blue being the United States, red being the competitor. We lose a lot of people. We lose a lot of equipment. We usually fail to achieve our objective of preventing aggression by the adversary. Everyone assumes based on 25 years of experience that we have a dominant military establishment, 
that when we go to war, we always win, we win big, and there isn't any question about this. And when you say to people, not so fast, they're shocked because they have not had this experience. And that was essentially the takeaway from the briefing. Um, we had invited all 100 members of the Senate and about a dozen showed up. And you know what, what Senator McCain and I did you know, in the aftermath uh, was sort of sitting in his office somewhat dispirited uh, just by the subject of the briefing and sort of you know, how it had accurately summed up you know, many of our own conclusions of staring at this problem for a very long time. Um, we, we essentially ended up in a conversation trying to think through, you know, God forbid if we ended up in, a, in an environment or a circumstance where the United States military uh, ended up in a conflict with China, what would that look like? And um, basically the, the sort of discussion that we had um, was, was also pretty glum. Um, you know, I think when, when we look at the types of systems that we would be you know, bringing into that fight, um, you know, you have a lot of short range fighter aircraft that don't have the range to get to their targets. Uh, you have a lot of, uh, you know, large ships, aircraft carriers and others that are going to struggle um, to move into position to be operationally relevant. Uh, you're going to have a lot of forward air bases and forward uh, military locations that are going to come under considerable attack from very precise and high quantities of precision weaponry. Um, you're not going to have, uh, you know, a, a lot of the systems that we would be counting on, you know, from an undersea standpoint, a long range strike standpoint um, to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, and the timelines on which this would occur, you know, would, would I think be very contrary to what the U.S. has expected in terms of our, our conduct of war over the past 30, uh, 25, 30 years. Um, and, you know, I think the, the sort of the takeaway for us is that the ways in which we have been building military power and the types of systems that we have been relying upon to deliver that military dominance that we've come to take for granted um, are increasingly being overtaken. Um, they're being called into question. And you know, ultimately the United States uh, from a national defense standpoint you know, has found itself in a position of having been disrupted. And you know, what I wanna unpack here today is sort of you know, what that looks like, um, how that disruption has occurred, why it has occurred, um, and then ultimately, you know, share some thoughts on, on how I think we move through this. Um, you know, but from the standpoint of the disruption, you know, I think it starts first and foremost with our competitors. Um, and, and foremost, I believe, you know, when you, when you look at China more than any, you know, as, as you kind of read the national defense strategy, the focus that I think that puts on China as sort of the pacing threat for U.S. military modernization, um, you know that that I believe is is you know is accurately placed. Um, the challenge that we have is for the better part of three decades, you know, China has been modernizing its military not to be like the United States, um, but to build the types of systems that would offset our advantages and undermine many of the core assumptions upon which the United States has been planning and building forces to project military power for a very long period of time. Uh, this has not been like a hurricane or an earthquake that you know, struck without warning one day. Uh, this has been a deliberate and methodical approach, you know, going back to the early 1990s based on you know, kind of perceived lessons learned from uh, the experience of the first Gulf War. And you look at the types of investments that have been made, um, you know, it's, been, it's been done very deliberately. You know, for focusing first and foremost on the type of infrastructure from which the United States would project military power, you know, building large quantities of uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, um, increasingly hypersonic weapons to just overwhelm America's warfighting infrastructure, land bases, sea bases, um, looking at all of the uh, sensing capability that you would need for the targeting uh, going after uh, you know, systems like aircraft carriers, you know, over the horizon radars, long range reconnaissance satellites, um, building a very dense and formidable network of integrated air defense systems um, to push back the ability of the United States uh, air power to penetrate into areas and conduct military operations, you know, hiding and evading detection and striking precisely. Um, Ultimately then, you know, kind of in, in service of what Chinese doctrine refers to as systems destruction warfare, um, building all of the underlying capabilities that, uh, that would be necessary to target the ways that the United States projects power 
um, the things that we have come to take for granted as having, uh, you know, will always be there for us, um, enabling us to project power. Things like logistics, moving large numbers of people and things across very large distances to sustain military operations. Um, space is a domain that, you know, I think we've, we've always believed would be a sanctuary for us. Um, the ability to move information, to collect intelligence, to effectively conduct command and control of our forces. Um, you know, all of these are vulnerable and at risk. Um, and the, the net effect of all of this you know, would be essentially uh, an ability to rip apart uh, America's battle networks and the ways that we um, bring forces together and project power uh, in terms of military operations. The, the thing that I, you know, that I stress in the book and I would stress here now is this doesn't mean that China is 10 feet tall. Uh, it doesn't mean that the United States has no ability to respond effectively. Um, what it means is that, you know, for the better part of three decades, you know, a disruption to the ways and means of American military power have been playing out um, in, in largely plain view. Um, and we have been saying many of the things that you know, one would think uh, to suggest that we were paying attention to this threat. Um, but we find ourselves now in a position where um, if you just listen to what senior defense officials are saying, um, uniformed and civilian uh, members of Congress, independent panels, uh, there is an emerging consensus that we have found ourselves in the position where our military technological advantage, um, the assumptions that we have traditionally made about uh, being able to fight from sanctuary, being able to project power from forward bases, uh, you know, controlling the timeline of military operations. You know, all of these things are, are either at risk or being surpassed. Um, and this is an enormous challenge to uh, how the United States thinks about military power. At the same time, you have a, a second disruption that's playing out in the form of technology. Um, we have in our defense industrial base you know, companies and technologies that are fundamentally focused on producing uh, relatively small numbers of very large, exquisite, expensive, uh, very heavily manned and hard to replace military platforms. Um, big ships, aircraft, bombers, combat vehicles, you know, very large satellites, uh, things that get built over a very long period of time by a very small number of companies or producers and uh, we, we think about operating these you know, exquisite systems for a very long period of time, you know, having them in service for decades in many cases, um, and not really having to focus as much on the modernization of them because our assumption for a long time has been, you know, we are so many laps ahead of our competition uh, that this type of approach to uh, you know, the, the production of military power will be sufficient for us. The challenge that we've seen over the past, uh, really, I'd say two decades, has been the emergence from the commercial sector of new technologies that call into question uh, the types of systems that we have been building, the types of approaches we've been taking, and what the future is going to make possible from a technological standpoint. Um, you know, in terms of things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, autonomous systems, you know, the proliferation of commercial space, um, you know, new satellites, small satellites, proliferated architectures on orbit, um, you know, quantum information technologies, you know, all of these things when taken together um, really do represent a, a revolution, a technological revolution that has largely caught our defense establishment off guard. Um, and to the extent that they, they haven't been caught off guard, it's often been uh, something that has been actively resisted in many cases by, uh, when I say the defense establishment, I'm talking about the Department of Defense, Congress, both bodies, both parties, uh, as well as you know defense industry, external <clears throat> groups. You know this is an ecosystem uh, that my old boss uh, lovingly used to refer to as the military-industrial congressional complex. Um, this has been incredibly slow to recognize the technological innovations that are taking place in the commercial sector. Um, and find opportunities to pull those technologies uh, in a meaningful way um, into, the, uh, into the production of military power. Um, just by way of an example, um, when you look at what is the most sophisticated weapon system in the US inventory right now, uh, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, um, what is referred to as the flying supercomputer because of its ability to collect and process information um, on board the platform. 
um, when you compare the onboard computer power, computing power, processing power um, of that system to uh, a best in breed, um, you know, sort of NVIDIA GPU uh, that is available on self-driving uh, commercial cars and trucks, um, that commercially available GPU that is fielded right now on cars in the parking lot uh, is hundreds of times more capable than the processor that is on board the most capable flying supercomputer in the US military inventory. Um, it's just to show how fast this technology has developed, how much it has scaled. Um, and when you speak about you know, the applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning, it ultimately comes down to the ability of computer power that you can bring to bear. Um, and if you're that limited in terms of your computer processing power, um, you can imagine how far behind we actually are from the real applications of things like artificial intelligence and machine learning um, in terms of real military programs. Um, and again, all of this has played out through uh, what has become you know, an increasingly consolidated, um, increasingly kind of calcified defense industrial base, you know, where at the end of the Cold War, we had 107 major defense firms. And by the end of the 1990s, we had five. Um, that consolidation continues to play out you know, with large corporate mergers and acquisitions. And what you've seen is the failure of small companies uh, to have an ability to scale into medium-sized and larger companies, as well as uh, a hollowing out of sort of the middle tier of our defense sector in America, um, either being bought up by larger companies or driven out of business altogether because they simply can't sustain themselves. Um, these are things that, you know, and this kind of goes to the third point here. Um, these didn't just happen by accident. Um, unfortunately, these are the products of incentives that have been created over a very long time inside of our defense establishment. Um, you know, how our government operates, how our industry operates, the nexus of those things together. Um, and ultimately, and this is kind of my thesis of the book, is that at the core of it is an intellectual failure um, to really understand, you know, what, uh, you know, what we're talking about when we're, we're referring to the, the real measurement of military power and, and what really matters uh, in the construction of military power and the operation of military systems. You know, all too often we get focused on uh, military platforms. Uh, we get focused on the vehicles, the ships, the aircraft that have delivered our dominance for a very long period of time. Um, we talk about incrementally improving those systems over their very long multi-decade lives. Um, the problem is that that's actually an input, it's not an outcome. And we have a system that is geared toward measuring and valuing inputs. You know, we talk about a 355 ship Navy as if that is the end, uh, you know, that we seek rather than a means, you know, a 386 squadron Air Force. You know, we measure everything in terms of the quantity of systems that we have. Um, and it's understandable because you can touch them, you can employ people to build them. They look good in parades. It enables you to compete effectively for money in the budget process by saying, you know, we have to buy X number of Y platform. Um, but the reality is that real military advantage um, is ultimately uh, sort of generated through the process that the United States military refers to as the kill chain. Um, and, and the reason I sort of focused on this as a theme for the book is because I actually believe that's what's really going on in the, you know, in the, in the conduct of military operations. You know, there's lots of different ways to sort of describe this, but um, you know, at a more general level, which is how I tried to focus it in the book, it is understanding decision-making and action. Um, and it, and it has nothing to do with the individual systems that I'm bringing to bear to do that. It's ultimately what quality of understanding, human understanding can I generate? Um, can I identify the things that are going on in the areas where militaries are competing, whether they're targets, red forces, blue forces? Um, can I accelerate uh, and improve the process of human decision-making? You know, can I collect lots of information and distill it into you know, insights and decisions for humans to make? And then can I actually command and control actions? Can I take actions in the world uh, that allow me to, uh, to have effects and, and ultimately influence the course of events? You know, that process uh, has nothing to do with the types of technologies we're fielding. Um, technology is ultimately a tool. And where we have failed intellectually is by 
getting so fixated on the tools that we have and how we make them incrementally better um, that we're not actually asking the question at a time of you know, sort of geopolitical and technological upheaval. Um, how can I actually solve these problems differently? Um, what will technology allow me to do differently? Um, not how will it allow me to say, solve the same problem I've been trying to solve for three decades the same way. Um, and that's ultimately, you know, to put a fine point on it, the problem that I think we face right now. Um, we are playing a losing game when it comes to national defense. Uh, it's a losing game because of the strategic choices that our competitors have made to put us into that position, um, as well as our own uh, sort of faults and failures um, to recognize, you know, what's happening technologically in the commercial world, how we could uh, better adapt uh, and change on the basis of those technologies and build different kinds of military systems, solve these problems differently. Um, and then as we look to the future, we're about to run out of money. Um, so, you know, as the old adage goes, you know, when, uh, when the money runs out, it's time to think. Um, this is an intellectual problem. This is a problem of thought. Um, we have to think ourselves out of this problem. Um, if we continue to throw money at the same types of systems and the same types of approaches that we have been trying to take for a very long time, I think we still lose. And I think what, look, what losing means over time is yes, God forbid, we could find ourselves actually losing the next war we're called upon to fight. Um, but I think you know, more likely uh, loss means the, the steady and continued erosion of conventional military deterrence. Um, strategic deterrence, you know, uh, nuclear forces, that's a separate issue. We can talk about that. Um, my concern is more that we are losing conventional military deterrence. And as that erodes, uh, it will embolden competitors uh, to, to be more ambitious, to seek more, um, to use their, uh, you know, kind of advantage in ways that fundamentally disadvantage the United States, the American people, our interests, our values, um, our sort of hopes for what uh, the world will look like. Um, this, I believe, has been playing out in front of us, and I think that story is only going to get worse uh, to the extent that we actually lose the ability to compete effectively uh, militarily, whether that is you know, outright military operations or kind of below the threshold of conflict uh, you know, in the sort of proverbial gray zone that we're talking a lot about where most of the sort of kicking under the table pushing and shoving is happening and will continue to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what, what I wanna do in closing is just kind of talk through, you know, the, the thoughts that I have as to how we, how we change. Um, and, and what was striking to me in the course of writing this book um, was going back and, and sort of reading and rereading many of the things that have been written for a very long time, uh, really over the past uh, 20, 25, 30 years um, about the types of changes that we're going to see unfolding in the world, uh, technologically, militarily, uh, and, and how strikingly similar uh, many of these things are. Uh, you know, much of what I say in this book is not new. Uh, I, I didn't come up with a lot of this. You know, in, in many instances, I just am so struck by the fact that I'm just reprising things that we have been saying for a very long period of time, but we have largely failed to do. You know, going back to network-centric warfare, the revolution in military affairs, defense transformation, you know, all these other things that uh, people on this call are familiar with. Um, you know, if you read and reread these documents next to what people, senior leaders are currently saying and writing, uh, it's remarkable how much it rhymes and how little we've actually done to affect those outcomes. So, you know, to me, it's sort of a, a twofold response. You know, one is that it has to happen at the level of ideas. You know, we have to start by thinking differently. Um, and then ultimately it comes down to execution, which I'll, which I'll touch on in closing. Um, at, at the level of ideas, I mean, I tend to think of this in terms of strategy, you know, just ends, ways, and means. Um, and I think all of those have to change. Um, you know, I think at the level of ends, you know, the objectives we seek, um, again, looking at this narrowly from, from a military standpoint, because, you know, again, what I stress in the book, and, and I, I can't stress enough here, uh, is that when we're looking at, you know, sort of great power competition or strategic competition with uh, a country like China, a government like the Chinese Communist Party, um, there, are, there are many dimensions to this problem, you know, diplomatic, political, economic, you know, the level of values, uh, information, um, all of those things I would argue are actually uh, going to be more relevant and more important in terms of how this competition plays out in the future. Um, 
but military power is something that, you know, at the most basic level, um, it's not going to be the thing that will enable us to succeed on its own, uh, but in the absence of it, we, we will lose and then we will fall behind. Um, so I'm looking at this, you know, more narrowly through the, the lens of sort of military strategy um, and military ends, ways and means. So from, from the standpoint of ends, um, you know, I think we need to have a reckoning with, uh, you know, kind of our strategic overextension that we've seen for a very long period of time. Um, the, the nature of great power competition that I think we rarely in Washington want to talk about is that having competitors who have um, or, or very soon could have, you know, economic uh, and or military parity with us or military technological parity um, inherently means that they will have an ability um, and likely a will um, to deny us having things that we want or achieving objectives that we seek. Um, this is the, the sort of the flip side of great power competition that, you know, we often gloss over in Washington, which is great powers have the ability to limit the ambitions uh, of their competitors. And I think we are seeing that uh, play out, have been seeing that play out for some time, and that's going to continue in the future. Um, for us to be serious about competing uh, at this level, um, I think we're going to have to prioritize it um, and make other things subservient. Um, for a long time, we've, we've kind of wanted to do everything. We've had a lot of extracurricular activities. Um, and the reality is, uh, in order to prioritize what we're now saying is most important from the standpoint of, you know, the way I would frame it, um, preventing Chinese military primacy uh, or, or military dominance. This needs to be the priority and other things need to be subordinated to it, especially uh, in an environment where resources are, are starting to dry up or are not going to be as plentiful uh, as, they, as they recently have been. Um, you know, my own belief is that the, the days of US military primacy are coming to an end if they have not ended already. And we need to acknowledge that. Uh, that is something that uh, you know, I would argue is probably likely to happen anyway, but a lot of the choices we've made and have not made have only accelerated uh, that erosion of, of military primacy. Um, I, I don't think that we're going to get that back. Um, I mean, you know, there could be aberrational events that, that uh, you know, perhaps uh, lead us into a different type of outcome. But, you know, my own belief here is at the level of objectives, you know, we need to be thinking much more around uh, denying outcomes and objectives to a competitor as opposed to somehow managing to restore the type of military primacy that we had you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, that sort of leads into the question of ways, the ways we actually use military power. Um, we have been planning for a very long period of time uh, to basically fight offensively, um, which, which, you know, is, I'm, I'm making this a, a comment at the level of how we actually conduct operations, not, you know, sort of the nature of the objectives that we've chosen. You know, we have projected military power across the world into the physical and digital space of a competitor. Uh, we have penetrated into their areas. We have conducted operations on timelines of our choosing from sanctuary, whether it's forward bases, space, the information environment. Um, and we have largely dominated our uh, competitors through uh, having military overmatch and technological superiority. Um, that sort of offensive way of war, you know, where we bring military operations to a competitor um, I think is something that is fundamentally changing and is going to have to change in terms of how we think about at the level of strategy, what we are trying to do. Um, I think the bad news for us is that these types of uh, you know, military modernization efforts that uh, China and others have been engaged in, you know, creating what we all know to be kind of anti-access area denial capabilities is making it incredibly difficult uh, to succeed in these classic uh, military competitions of you know, evading detection, hiding versus finding, kind of penetrating versus repelling. Um, these are things that are going to make offensive operations quite difficult. Uh, the projection of power, uh, the penetration of physical and digital space, quite difficult. Um, my own sense is that, you know, at, the bad news is we've built a military that is fundamentally kind of geared around um, the offensive projection of military force at a time when that's becoming really difficult. Um, the good news, I think, is that two can play at this game. Um, if we think differently about 
uh, fighting defensively more than fighting offensively, um, trying to deny objectives uh, from our competitors rather than trying to control outcomes or physical space. Um, I think we can actually achieve the uh, sort of national defense objectives and priorities that, um, that we have um, in terms of restoring deterrence. Um, this is something that I think is, is imminently doable, but it means that we have to jettison a lot of the ways that we've been planning to fight uh, in favor of a much more defensive, um, you know, kind of denial focused, uh, you know, military, uh, sort of military way of war. Um, and this kind of gets into the question of means. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we have, we have largely, you know, optimized our military over many decades around you know sort of smaller and smaller quantities of rather large expensive um, very heavily manned and hard to replace military systems and platforms and i think the reality is that when you really look at how these new technologies are going to um, enable us to think about this problem differently and fight differently um, it's really at the level of networking um, it's how do i bring larger quantities of more autonomous systems to bear how do I take advantage of artificial intelligence and machine learning to offload a lot of the cognitive burden uh, that we currently burden uh, you know, US military operators of having to stare at a lot of screens, having to process a lot of information, having to sift through a lot of haystacks looking for needles. Um, this simply slows us down and, and eliminates our ability to scale. Um, so I think when you, when you kind of ask the question of how will these technologies allow us to fight differently, um, or operate differently or feel different kinds of military uh, systems or approaches. You know, to me, it is around uh, a very different kind of military force that is going to be um, much larger in quantity, um, relatively smaller in size, you know, at a system by system level, um, that is going to be highly autonomous, you know, highly intelligent and much lower cost. Um, how do I operate large networks of systems? Um, and how do I do this in a very distributed manner um, over very large territories um, and automate a lot of the process that currently takes you know, lots of human beings uh, to, to, to conduct? Um, to me, that is going to be you know, the central challenge that we face from the standpoint of building military power differently. Um, and these technologies, I think, will enable us to do that. I think they already are enabling us to do that. And this finally kind of gets down to the question of incentives. Um, you know, I think for me, I, uh, I, I come off in the book as somewhat pessimistic about our ability to change, and, and I am, um, but, I, but I am ultimately an optimist in the sense that um, I think many of the things that we need at sort of a larger level um, to make a type of change like this, of, you know, changing a kind of our ends, ways, and means, um, you know, to building a defense strategy that I think is more around, you know, kind of how do we create national defense in the absence of dominance? Um, we have the core things that we need to do this effectively. We have incredibly talented people, uh, both in government and out, um, who are entrepreneurial, well-educated, critical thinking, hardworking, public spirited. Um, we have remarkable technology, um, you know, to a large extent, yes, in our defense industrial base, um, but to a larger extent, you know, kind of in our, in our national technological base, you know, our commercial economy, um, you know, we have remarkable companies and, and uh, you know, and technologies that are still leading the world in many instances. Um, and at the end of the day, we have a ton of money. Uh, you know, even today, we are spending, uh, you know, in excess of $700 billion on national defense. And, you know, even if budgets are flat or they turn down, uh, we're still going to be spending a considerable amount of money on national defense. You know, so we have people, we have technology, we have money. Um, the thing that has you know, been our impediment um, is, is us. Um, we have you know, consistently kind of blocked our own kicks. Um, we have created a system that measures the wrong things, um, that is far too slow to change. Uh, that is that is far too slow to bring new technologies and new ideas in. That's much more focused and geared on how to actually keep those things out. Um, those are the things that need to change at the level of incentives. Um, we have gotten into this problem because of the incentives we created. Um, I think the good news is that we can create different incentives. This is not a cultural problem uh, that is uh, something that we can't overcome. Um, this is ultimately something that different incentives can, over time, 
uh, generate different behavior. And what I mean by that is, I think that the types of ideas and the types of uh, capabilities that are going to be important for us are going to be uh, things that we're going to have to experiment our way into. Um, we have a system that's fundamentally geared toward, you know, trying to predict the future on very long timelines, uh, trying to micromanage the production of technology and capabilities. You know, I kind of joke that if, you know, I were, if I were asked to use kind of our current uh, military requirements process and acquisition process to, uh, you know, get my, my iPhone, you know, I wouldn't have had an iPhone if you'd asked me to, uh, to use this process 10, 15 years ago, I'd have the best flip phone in America. Um, we've got to create a, a process that uh, recognizes that we are going to get these things wrong. Um, we are not going to know what is going to work better than other things. We're not going to know what ideas or technologies are really going to be uh, path-breaking and game-changing as far as how we operate differently to solve these problems differently. Um, but we're going to have to experiment our way through this. Um, our, our defense establishment has become way too consolidated uh, way too slow to change. Um, and to the extent that we're bringing new technologies in, you know, we're making very large numbers of very small bets. You know, we're buying a lot of, you know, science projects and small prototypes, um, but they don't ever scale to influence uh, institutions, you know, at scale. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, the real benefits of the technological revolution that we're seeing right now is it will allow us to buy military power differently. You know, we don't have to operate on these very long timelines um, where you have a very long government funded R&D cycle uh, with limited procurement and then planning to operate and maintain uh, military systems for decades. You know, unmanned systems, more autonomous systems, you know, software defined technologies and capabilities. These are things that we can buy and need to buy a lot more regularly. Um, there are things that can be competed out to determine what are the best capabilities um, so that we're buying new things more often rather than maintaining and sustaining old things for a very long time. And I think this is ultimately how you begin to, to sort of create different incentives inside uh, defense industry, the industrial base, um, is that if I'm buying new things more regularly, if I'm actually competing them on a level playing field, so you know, a company nobody has ever heard of has an opportunity to compete against uh, you know, a household name defense company uh, or a laboratory or whomever. Um, and I'm simply picking winners based on performance, uh, which is something we, we, we truly do not do right now. Uh, we buy PowerPoint presentations and white papers, uh, but if I can adjudicate performance and buy the things that are working best, I can on-ramp better technology faster. And that begins to create incentives for uh, new entrants, new companies, commercial companies to get back into national defense work. Um, to uh, a signal to investors that, you know, as companies are scaling and succeeding by doing this work and doing it differently, um, the types of investments in defense companies or national defense are actually generating returns. Um, and more of that money that is just sitting on the sidelines every day in terms of private capital looking for things to do can actually be brought to bear to, to create new companies and fund new technologies, um, new developmental efforts. Um, and ultimately, it gets down to the level of human capital. So, you know, your your best in breed uh, software developers and computer scientists, you know, people who are graduating from MIT and have real options about where they go, um, are seeing incentives that that draw them into national defense work and developing technology for national defense purposes, as opposed to going into the commercial economy to build uh, advertising optimization algorithms for for Google or Facebook. Um, these are things that I believe at the level of incentives we can create. Um, can we do all of this? Uh, you know, I believe we can. Um, I believe it's sort of like, you know, executing a very complex dive off of a 10 meter platform. Uh, it's going to be incredibly difficult, but it is doable. Um, I think to go back to, you know, my, my source of frustration and pessimism is simply, you know, whether we have the political will to do it, um, whether we actually are going to believe that you know, change here is not optional, in my opinion. Uh, this is something that we have to do, and we have to believe a failure to do it uh, will generate consequences that um, are, are truly horrific for us um, in terms of the type of world we're going to live in and, you know, the type of future that we're going to have. And, and if we don't have that sort of, um, you know, 
recognition and belief at the level of imagination of what the stakes really are here. Um, I do think we will continue to mess around with business as usual and political gamesmanship um, and partisan fighting. Um, and that will be an impediment to getting where we need to go. Um, and ultimately, um, I, you know, I hate to say this, but um, you know, change will occur one way or the other. You know, it will either happen through you know, sort of leadership uh, and imagination and will um, now when we need it, or it will happen in the aftermath of catastrophe. And I, I sort of hope and pray that it will be the former, and I fear that it could be the latter. So, you know, as, as I look at all of this, you know, I think we have a real opportunity and necessity to, to do things differently here. And my hope is that, uh, you know, in the years ahead, we'll, we'll get after this in a way that I still think uh, we, we, we just aren't doing enough and moving fast enough with enough of a sense of urgency. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I would be happy to, uh, to, to use the time remaining to talk through what you guys are thinking, ask questions, um, and then continue the discussion. Great, Chris, thank you so much. That was a <clears throat> wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, overview. And uh, the floor is open now. Uh, you can uh, get in the queue different ways. Um, raise your hand in Zoom, um, send a message uh, in the chat <clears throat> and uh, or, or, or put a message onto uh, the YouTube chat. So let me start with uh, Suzanne Freeman. Suzanne, if you can uh, turn your uh, video on and ask your question. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for a really, really, really interesting talk. And as Vipin said, not the most uplifting talk. Um, but you made a good argument that what's going on is really an intellectual problem and the change is slow. But you did say that you didn't think culture was a problem, but rather it's a problem of incentives. I guess I want to push you a little bit further on this culture point. Does military culture really have no role, play no role in adopting artificial intelligence technology? But my, my argument would be that once this technology is procured, it does actually need to be adopted by the services. And frequently the demand for new technology comes from the services. I'm sort of thinking of things that might matter like trust in officers at various levels, the willingness to delegate authority, the willingness to change existing standard operating procedures. So I'm curious sort of if you, if you really think that military culture plays, plays no role in this story. Yeah, so I, I, I maybe rephrase what I said. Um, I, I, I think it's an impediment, but I don't think that it's insurmountable. I think culture often gets held up as this sort of Borg um, that no matter what we do or the choices we make, it's it's fundamentally going to you know prevent us from getting where we want to go. You know, I'm I'm more of a believer that you know culture is the product of patterns of behavior that you know play out over time, and those patterns of behavior are the result of incentives that are created in institutions. Um, based on how we value things, how we reward and punish people. Um, and, and I think that's where I, where I come back to the question of, you know, yeah, culture will be an impediment, but it's, it's not insurmountable. I think it's something that we can change. Um, it's the kind of thing that um, senior leaders, you know, sort of uh, setting a different example can begin to slowly change those organizations. You know, that if we can actually put in place processes that, um, that, that actually value the things that are valuable and ask the right questions rather than measure the wrong things uh, and focus on the wrong uh, things in terms of inputs rather than what are the outcomes the organization is trying to accomplish. Um, it begins to help us see ourselves and understand and value the things that are truly going to be relevant and important in the future um, and things that are maybe, uh, you know, we're good ideas, we're valuable, but are increasingly wasted assets that we need to cut away from and divest from. Um, I think the problem we have is that we, we don't see ourselves accurately in that regard. We don't value the right things and the incentives are misaligned in a way that, you know, the people who actually can create these types of changes rarely actually understand how to use their authority effectively. And the people who are down there making uh, a lot of the decisions that are really going to be necessary to take institutions in a different direction, um, don't have the incentives to make hard decisions. They don't have the political top cover to do it. Um, and, and frankly, these are decisions that probably need to be made by, you know, whether it's uh, you know, democratically elected leaders or Senate confirmed officials. I mean, people who have a political mandate you know, to sort of eat sins and bear risk. Um, that I see is the misalignment. But uh, again, I think these are, these are things that are within our power in terms of how senior leaders spend time focus priorities, 
um, and govern their own institutions, which oftentimes I think they're, they're reluctant or unable to do uh, or unwilling to do. Um, it's not gonna change overnight. Uh, it's gonna be something that's gonna play out. I guess it's more a reaction to what I hear oftentimes of you know, people sort of throwing their hands up in despair and saying, it's all a cultural problem, we're doomed. Um, and, I, and I think it's more complicated than that, but I do admit that it's going to be incredibly difficult for the reasons you mentioned. Great, thanks. Um, next, uh, Eric Lynn Greenberg. Eric, uh, please turn on your video and ask your question. Uh, thanks so much for, for the really interesting and I guess not so uplifting talk. Uh, I think my, my question touches upon something that, that Peter Dutton also mentioned in the comments. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about really the role that allies and partners play in your story, right? Because obviously it would likely play a role in any kind of future competition. And it seems that certain allies and partners have for, for one reason or another, uh, done a better job at, at developing and integrating some of these new emerging technologies that you talk about in your book. Um, so, so what role do they play essentially in kind of your story that you tell us? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question, and you know um, the challenge of writing a relatively short book for a general audience on a very short timeline is you end up passing over a lot of things that you could write an entire book about unto itself. Allies are one of them. Um, I mean, I look at allies simply through the lens of we're not going to be able to compete effectively on our own. Um, we're going to need to have the ability to multiply our power with friends and allies, like-minded partners, which again, you know, kind of going to the, you know, kind of the good news side of this, like we do have, you know, even for all of the trials and tribulations of the past three and a half years, um, you know, our sort of traditional allies and partners are still rooting for America. I mean, they're starting to make their own side bets about, you know, potential courses of action, um, but they would rather be working with us than competing against us. Um, I think part of the challenge for us is, we, we speak a big game, we talk a big game about the centrality of allies, but we don't really follow through on it. Um, you know, we, we criticize our allies for not making enough investments in military technology, but then we turn around and fail to do technology transfers or arms sales that um, make sense for our own domestic political reasons, but actually have the net effect of not empowering uh, allies and partners as much as, uh, as they would want and, and we say we want. Um, when we look at the actual operational integration of allies into U.S. military operations or, you know, kind of the conduct and planning of, of military operations, um, it doesn't really happen in a meaningful way. Um, you know, there's sort of the sense of, you know, look, we'll all hold conferences and talk with one another about how important the alliance is. But, you know, if the balloon goes up, it's really going to be America that does the heavy lifting and you guys are just going to kind of stay in the rear and hold our coat. Um, that, that's just something we've got to get beyond. Um, and, you know, the, the flip side of that is particularly as we look at a more and more, uh, you know, sort of stressing case of great power competition and what, you know, God forbid, actual competition and conflict would look like in this type of an environment. Um, allies have to make themselves defensible if they are going to assert that they should be defended. Um, you know, nobody can expect the United States to sort of fight to the last American for a losing cause and an ally that has not done the things that they need to do to make the right investments, you know, the right doctrinal changes around um, making themselves more defensible. So for those frontline allies that have a choice right now about how they're going to spend their limited money, um, I'd like to see more of them uh, investing in their own anti-access and area denial capabilities. I'd like to see them you know, the sort of uh, porcupine strategy of just making themselves an unappealing, uh, you know, target. Um, things that, that are talked about, but, but aren't always kind of implemented and followed through on to the degree that they need to. Um, so there is an obligation on both sides here. Um, I do think that we're not going to be able to um, purely with US military or American power alone. You know, this is something we need uh, kind of the multiplying effect of allies and partners to contribute to. Um, that means we have to do some things on our side that are going to force us uh, in an uncomfortable way uh, to make some changes. And it's going to force some difficult conversations with allies and partners about things we need them to do um, to sort of pull their weight and make themselves more defensible and, and more effective in these competitions. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> next, uh, Barry Posen. Barry, if you want to turn on your video and ask your question. So um, you've said many, you made many acute observations here and there's many of them with which I would naturally agree. I wanna ask you a, a question about um, sort of obstacles to 
to change that you, you sort of we may be overlooking. Um, you know, I'm an old dog now, so I, I was doing defense analysis you know, back in Cold War days. And over time, uh, it seemed, and maybe it was an illusion, that, um, uh, that militaries were becoming a somewhat less opaque. In other words, the, the process of hearings and competition and, and uh, gap scares and everything else, it generated information. It really kind of remarkable amounts. And, you know, if you look at what was around at the end of the Cold War, and then you can compare it to you know, what's now unclassified about the Soviet military that we had then, it, it looks sort of the same, right? It's not like there was a big gap. Now, it's my perception that partly as a result of 9-11, partly as a result of changes in um, the balance of power between the legislature and the executive, that in fact, uh, the level of opacity is shot way up, right? And there's some examples that kind of occur to me, right? Um, you know, in the areas that you're talking about, much of it is in the intelligence realm. And uh, we declassify the intelligence, you know, the top line every year, and it's about $80 billion. And nominally, maybe a quarter of that is meant for military things, but we know that washes back and forth. Most of us know nothing about how that money is spent, right? And it's a big chunk of the American security effort every year, and some of it's hidden in the DOD, is in that. So there's a big piece of exactly the kinds of, of capacities that you're talking about that we can't see and we can't judge. So the, from the point of view of mobilizing external support for change, you are in the position of coming out of that world and ringing an alarm bell that you have to, that you end up ringing in a way that is, I won't say fact-free, but is devoid of a lot of the, 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 the rich information you would need to persuade us. And the same is true of, of the RDT and E effort more generally, right? Much of the RDT and effort is in the compartmented world. We don't really know what they're doing. You mentioned capabilities of the F-35. We sort of know what these are, but we really don't. I mean, I've talked to F-35 pilots, been to the bases. I sort of have a sense of this thing. But nevertheless, very hard to judge, right? So I guess what I'm asking you is, is do you agree that this phenomenon that I'm observing is, this is an accurate observation? Do we have a whole lot of opacity in the system now that's now built in? And second of all, what kind of an obstacle to change is this opacity? Uh, it, it's it's a great observation and a great point, and I'm and I'm not surprised. I'm a big fan of yours. I cite your work in my book. Um, I I would agree with it, and I'll take it a step further. Um, I think yes, uh, to a certain extent, the opacity is a function of technology, um, electronic warfare, cyber. I mean, these these things are complicated. Uh, they're hard to understand. Um, they're not sort of immediately apparent in the way that you know, the kinds of things that we could count during the Cold War, you know, made it a little bit more real and tangible. It's opaque as well, uh, unfortunately, I think because um, a lot of people aren't spending the time necessary to make it less opaque. Um, you know, members of Congress are not doing the type of oversight that they need to do to understand how these things come together, um, what, this, you know, so what, what the pitch count really is, um, how we measure up. Um, which doesn't mean that they're going to come out and you know, sort of divulge large quantities of classified information, um, but they can come out with insights and a sense of alarm and a sense of urgency, which you know, certainly I spent my time in the Congress trying to uh, you know, better inform you know, members of Congress as to what's really going on. And, and I think, you know, you, you, again, you sort of see reflections on the wall of the types of things that are now being said by you know, the chief of staff of the Air Force, the commandant of the Marine Corps, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and yes, unfortunately, you know, I'd love to see more information in the public domain to back up those, you know, kind of assertions and alarming statements. Um, but I'd like to think that, you know, that in and of itself would, would be enough to kind of motivate people to say, wow, you know, if, if people in those positions are saying those things, um, this really should create a, a sense of urgency to do things differently. The, the thing I would say in terms of an impediment, you know, and maybe this is a different put on it, the one that you were thinking of, the, the frustrating thing that I see with opacity has to do with how we manage military programs. Um, we, we compete something out, uh, you know, again, at the level of a PowerPoint presentation, you get different companies that respond, one gets an award, um, 
And it's basically then sort of, you know, part in the reference, but like tenure at a university. It's like once you've got your program of record, never shall you lose it. It's kind of yours forever. Um, and what we need to do is, is eliminate the opacity in terms of how systems actually can compete with one another. Um, can we begin to create more mechanisms for openness and competition between military technologies um, and force um, sort of portfolios of systems to have to compete against one another on a more regular basis? Um, as in like every year I'm going to do a technology on-ramp or a fly-off or a shoot-off or a bake-off where I'm going to take the best things that I have available to me now um, and I'm going to compete them against one another and I'm going to buy the best versions. And you know, for those of you who ended up on the losing end, you know, don't fear because we're coming right back and we're doing this in a year. So make investments, bring your A game and you can compete for a larger share of those programmatic dollars next year. Eliminate the opacity through competition. The only way things get better is by, by forcing them to compete against one another, I believe. Um, and for all of our talk of competition in the defense world, it's striking to me how little competition, meaningful competition there actually is, whether it's intellectual, programmatic, technological. Um, and you know, that, that's not by accident. You know, there's lots of reasons why the system doesn't want to do that, and, and we can unpack that. But you know, what, I, what, I, you know, what I'm concerned about from the standpoint of opacity is there will always be limitations to what we can say publicly about you know, what's really going on. Um, what I'd like to see us do is eliminate some of the barriers to entry um, and create sort of more transparent and more competitive environments to actually figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, whether it's at the level of ideas, operational concepts, organizational structures, or you know, at the, the most basic level, capability um, and how we solve those problems differently. Um, I think that's an eminently doable thing. Um, I think we can eliminate opacity in that respect, not for everything, um, but for a large, um, and I would argue probably a preponderance of the things we buy. Um, I'd like to see us buy them a little bit more like I buy technology in the commercial world, recognizing that it's never going to be you know, completely similar. Um, and I think that's, that is one way to begin to get at the opacity question is, is through more openness and competition, even if the results or the, all of the details of that are not necessarily kind of made known to the public. You know, people who are inside who have to make very expensive decisions will have more information um, and more data to make performance-based, outcome-based decisions. Um, rather than I think what we have now, which is largely kind of argument, assertion, and you know, sort of you know, bureaucratic infighting. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. It's a great question, um, and you know, I would love to see opacity eliminated at least in that way, or, or cracked into at least in that way, because I think it would make a huge difference. Great, thanks. So, uh, so last question for our live stream portion will be from uh, Roger Peterson. Roger, if you want to turn your video on and ask your question. Is my video on? You are on. Hey. Okay. Well, first off, I read your book with great interest, by the way. Taylor, you didn't hold up a copy of the book. So hey. uh, one, one question, well, I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to get the um, uh, main point I want to make. What we do at SSP sometimes is look at states and their, their theories of victory for war. And one thing to do to deter a state is to make sure that their theory of victory of war can't be uh, be accomplished. So when I was reading through your book, um, what was did you did you present us with a theory of victory for future wars in the book? And I think on from page 152, just to get people on page what you what you're doing here, uh, I think you have a, a, a statement that you write the critical source of future military advantage, will be the ability to impose so many complex dilemmas on our opponents at once that we shatter their kill chains, disrupt their ability to command and control their own forces and leave them incapable of understanding what is happening, making sound decisions and taking relevant actions. So the question I have from that, if this is how you win future wars, what, what do you want us to study at SSP that helps us understand that. Because generally, you know, we study things like balances, balances of power, 
or deterrence. We look at, you know, how do we deter nuclear war? Well, we have invulnerable second strike capabilities, and then we count up the platforms that are like that. Or we do game theory of strategic kinds of, of, of things, uh, statistical studies. We talk about polarity. What, what the future of war is how to be really clever. And is there like a, a balance of the ability of disruption? Is there, how, how do you want us to, to dive into this? What should our, what's your recommendations for our, um, our methods here if this is, is how wars are won? So it's it's a fantastic question, and and you know I'm I'm going to sort of think out loud, which always gets me in trouble, but I really do want to think about it because I honestly I hadn't ever asked the question of myself that way. Um, look, at, at a certain level, I actually think the things that you're raising um, are the things that we do still need to absolutely think about and study. Um, you know, sort of what drives strategic decision making? Um, how do you contextualize information? You know, what are uh, our theories of victory, you know, what are our competitors' theories of victory? What are they actually trying to do? Um, which, you know, I, I don't think that we always fully understand. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, being a little bit more, I guess, technical or specific about it, you know, one of the thoughts that I've been kind of kicking around myself in an article I want to write, um, I, I don't think that we're, our system from a defense establishment standpoint is not geared toward actually measuring the right things. So, you know, I tend to think in terms of, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of a core unit of value is the kill chain in terms of can I, can I collect information, generate insight and understanding, um, lead into human decision making, and then take an action out of that? And what is the speed and scalability um, of that, irregardless of the types of systems that I'm, that I'm using? Um, so when, when we sort of think about, you know, well, how do I measure my ability to do that? I think that's where we have a systemic failure in the United States. You know, we're focused on counting ships, you know, how many soldiers are in the army, uh, you know, sort of, yes, like what is the strategic balance in terms of things that are, that are countable to me in terms of platforms, systems, um, conventional military hardware. Um, I'm a baseball fan. I always look for an opportunity to, you know, kind of uh, make sense of life through baseball analogies. I mean, it's comparable in a sense, I believe, to, you know, what baseball went through 20 years ago with the introduction of sabermetrics. Of, you know, we we have a we have one system that is geared toward measuring, you know, the wrong things in terms of player performance. Um, but the reality is we need a whole different, I think, you know, way of quantifying the value of players in the context of the team. Um, what is it you're actually trying to do? Um, I would argue we're trying to understand, decide, and act faster and at greater scale than a competitor. Um, well, so the things I should measure and care about are the speed with which I can do that, the latency that I'm moving information around a network, um, the just amount of payload that I can bring into a physical space, regardless of what sort of truck or system is getting it there. Um, the, the scalability of this in terms of how much am I automating? How much am I relying on humans to do things as opposed to enabling and empowering humans to do more through the introduction of more intelligent systems? Um, I, I think there's a whole way that we're going to need to kind of re-ask the question of what we really value and what we wanna buy. Um, and, and I don't know what that looks like from an academic standpoint. I mean, I, you know, as when I think about it from sort of more of a program evaluation, program analysis standpoint, you know, I think there's a really interesting and sort of fruitful area of generating a whole different sort of set of metrics to, you know, to better quantify and understand and evaluate and assess the, the performance of systems in the context of the overarching whole, um, which we do a very you know, bad job of. We always measure things in isolation, you know, how far does this platform fly? You know, how much does this ship carry? Um, which are interesting questions, but they're not actually the ones that make the most impact. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether that's something that, that academically can become a field of study, but I, I think there's a way of asking this in more of a network centric way and less of a platform centric way um, that, that might lead to some really interesting areas to, to measure things differently and evaluate us uh, you know, through, through different performance parameters. I don't know if that answers your question. Like I said, I'm thinking out loud and that usually gets me in trouble. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, 
Let's bring an end uh, portion to the live stream. So thanks to everyone who uh, tuned in on YouTube and for uh, everyone at MIT, please